Hello and welcome to episode 33, Remastered. Today, I'll be continuing my series on the diversity of life by exploring the next major lineage that diverged from the Protista. This green-blooded lineage is that of the plants and the green algae. Now, so far in this series, I've covered the very first life forms, the bacteria and the archaea, which cover everything in their billions and trillions, as well as the organisms that diverged from them to split into a huge spectrum of eukaryotic species collectively called the protista. The protista have split into numerous groups and clades, among them three very successful branches, the kingdom plantea, the kingdom fungi, and the kingdom animalia. Each of these kingdoms has many thousands of micro and macroscopic species, that cover the globe with breathtaking diversity. I'll be covering these branches over the next three episodes, starting today with the oldest among them, the plants and the green algae. Although green algae is technically considered a protist, they are the direct ancestors to land plants. Both green algae and land plants belong to a clade called the green plants, also known as the Verita plantea. These green plants share a common ancestry that makes itself very clear in the qualities that are shared across the clade. For example, both green algae and land plants perform photosynthesis, with similar patterned arrangements of organelles called thylakoids. They share many of the same proteins, like beta-carotene, and the enzymes chlorophyll A and B. They have similar cell walls, similar sperm gametes, similar organelles, and they both use starch as an energy storage molecule. The genetic and biochemical similarities confirm the close evolutionary relationship between green algae and land plants. The green algaes most closely related to land plants are known to live in freshwater ponds and lakes, which gives us a clue as to the origin or the evolutionary emergence of the land plants. The first green algae, and thus the common ancestor for all green plants, came about a little over 700 million years ago. These first green algae species spent about two to two and a half million centuries diversifying and expanding across the world's floodplains, across the world's lakes and rivers. Understand that these first green algae were single-celled microbes that typically possessed two flagella and they would go through their life cycles by forming reproducing colonies. These colonies of single-celled microbes would form macroscopic structures that resembled little green blobs or little green growths. Among them, the ulvophytes came first, being little more than small green blobs with a curious shape or pattern to their structure. The coleocaetes diverged from them, and the caraphytes diverged from them. All of these lineages of green algae were becoming more and more plant-like, with some of the later caraphytes even showing cellular differentiation in their colonial structures, until eventually, among them, the first land plants actually emerged. The evidence of these first plants comes in the form of fossilized spores and the sporangia that create them, some 475 million years ago. The first land plants were small. They were, they were small, non-vascular organisms like mosses and liverworts. Because they lacked vascular tissue, they could only move water through their bodies through diffusion, which put a very serious size constraint to the, to the limits of their growth. But they did have a very useful adaptation called a cuticle, which is a waxy layer of material that's secreted onto the surface of the plant. This cuticle is like a watertight seal, which helps the plant to avoid water loss. This would have been a critically important feature in the first organisms to move from the oceans and the lakes and the rivers onto dry land, as well as organisms that didn't have veins and couldn't risk drying out. However, the cuticle comes with a distinct disadvantage. While it is very good at sealing in water, and that's good for the plant, by the very same mechanism, it also blocks gas exchange between the plant and the atmosphere. This led to another evolutionary adaptation with structures called the stomata. 
These stomata are like little holes, or like little tiny pores, that are bordered by two guard cells, and the guard cells can be opened or closed, to thus open or close the pore itself. When the guard cells are pumped full of water, they, they become turgid, they tighten, and they distort, opening the pore and allowing gases to flow into and out of the plant tissue. When the guard cells are dehydrated, the cell membranes are somewhat relaxed, and they're, they're sagging closer together. The pore is closed, and no gas exchange occurs. While the evolution of the cuticle was critically important for plants to move onto dry land, the evolution of the stomata was equally important, as it allowed the plants to continue breathing. All of these non-vascular land plants remained relatively small and simple, for nearly 60 million years, they were confined to the wet areas that were close to a lake or a river because they simply hadn't evolved the capacity to deal with the, the, the aridity and the moisture loss that came with life in a dry terrestrial habitat. At least, this was until they began to undergo an evolutionary explosion of their own, much like the Cambrian explosion was to the diversity of animals in the ocean. At the start of the Devonian period, or the Age of Fish, the land plants went through a brief window of intense diversification, where virtually all of the major features of modern plants emerged. The green algae, which previously had been little more than exotic green lumps and stalk-like growths, had finally evolved vascular structures in their tissues, allowing them to transport water more efficiently over longer distances. These water and sugar transporting veins were critically important to the future evolution of the land plants because they provided two extremely useful functions. The first vascular tissue was little more than tube-shaped cells that created efficient corridors for water transport. But because these tube-shaped cells weren't very strongly reinforced, they couldn't grow very large. They, if they grew too large, the weight of the water and the water pressure within them would be too much for them to structurally handle. They would break and be destroyed. The molecule lignin is really strong for its weight, and lignin was first evolved as an adaptation to reinforce these water-conducting cells, which gave them more structural support and enabled them to form the cellular pipes that run through the length of the plant. As this vascular tissue continued to evolve, it would become stronger, able to support more and more weight, and more and more internal pressure. Really strong plant tissue tends to be packed with lignin, which is the case when you have bundles of thousands of these vascular pipes all running in parallel, like in the trunk and the branches of a tree. The biological material called wood is as strong and sturdy as it is because the ordered columns of cells in the vascular tissue are all lined with a huge amount of lignin. In vascular tissues with less lignin, the plant can be held aloft against the forces of gravity simply by the pressure of water flowing through its veins. This is why when you look at herbaceous plants, they tend to wilt or droop when they're dehydrated. They don't have the internal water pressure to keep them turgid, and as a result, the plant's tissues begin to droop. Although this is usually the case in herbaceous plants, because in woody plants, the wood structure, the lignin, tends to provide enough strength that even if the plant is a little dehydrated, it won't necessarily look all droopy like that. It's a little stiffer than the herbaceous plants. Anyways, let's go on to the evolution of leaves. The evolution of leaves increased the surface area of plant tissue capable of performing photosynthesis, and this increased surface area enabled them to produce more energy, and thus to produce more sugars to sustain their growth. In addition to the leaves, the plants began evolving various pigments and flavonoids to protect their DNA from the intense ultraviolet radiation of the sun. Life in the water was a lot safer in this regard, as UV radiation can only penetrate the uppermost layers of the water. When the plants migrated onto dry land, they were exposed to the punishing glare of the sun, with none of the protections offered by the water, so they had to evolve their own defenses. The evolution of root tissue allowed plants to tap into the water and the nutrients that are hidden deeper in the soil. 
Now, all of these adaptations, from lignin to leaves to roots, enabled the plants to take in more nutrients and more light, to grow larger, and to become more complex and more hardy and more resistant to the rigors of the natural environment. Along with their newly evolved traits, the land plants would undergo major radiations, expanding away from the lakes and rivers to adapt to drier and increasingly hostile environments. The very first vascular plants to emerge were the lycophytes, which are today small, simple plants that reproduce by releasing spores into the environment. The spores are part of a cycle called the alternation of generations, which is a reproductive strategy that's common in most protista, including green algae, as well as many plants. But I'll describe alternation of generations in more detail in, in a few minutes. The species of lycophytes that are alive today are all pretty small, but when they were the only land plants on Earth, or when they were the only vascular land plants on Earth, they could grow to the size of modern-day trees. After the lycophytes diverged the ferns about 360 million years ago, and these diversified to produce lineages like the whisk ferns and the horsetails. All of these seedless plants that reproduced with spores existed in a fascinating evolutionary period of time called the Carboniferous Period. The land plants had already emerged, which meant that they could grow and reproduce on land. But the bacteria and the fungi that could decompose the lignin in their tissues had not yet emerged. As a result of the seedless plants living and dying, their bodies accumulated on the swampy forest floors without decomposing. This created massive piles of lingering plant tissue, and over geological periods of time, these were compressed under layers of rock and soil. The pressure crushed the plant tissue and converted all the carbon into rich deposits of coal. So far in their evolutionary history, all of the plants that have emerged on Earth have been confined to humid environments like wetlands, swamps, and the coasts of lakes and rivers. A big reason why seedless plants never got very far outside of these humid habitats was because their spores couldn't handle extreme dryness. Without enough water in the air, the spores would dry out, and they would become withered husks, unable to germinate. For the plants to move into the drier regions of the world, they would need a way to reproduce that wasn't dependent on these fragile spores. This evolutionary pressure eventually gave rise to the seed. Beginning 300 million years ago, the first gymnosperms emerged, with their seed-based method of replication. The seed was a hardier method of reproduction, because it could endure greater temperature extremes and lower humidity than a typical spore, while still being able to germinate, and this enabled the gymnosperms to grow in areas that the seedless plants, the, the spore-producing plants, could not, like mountainous terrain or dry expanses of continental land. For the very first time in the Earth's history, the land plants spread out to cover the near entirety of the planet's available land. Where the plants grew freely, they crafted an environment more accommodating and hospitable to the animal life that would follow, turning the brutal mineral crust into a verdant habitat lush with green plants and rich soils. For nearly 150 million years, the gymnosperms thrived. They covered the planet and diversified into thousands of distinct species, with an enormous variety in morphologies and ecological roles. But in time, the reign of the gymnosperms would come to an end, as they began to face competition from the newly emerged angiosperms. The angiosperms are the flowering plants, or the plants that use a kind of flower structure as part of their reproduction. This angiosperm lineage is very diverse, including species as small and humble as grasses, to those as large and regal as maple trees and oak trees, as well as all of the more obvious flowering plants like tulips, sunflowers, roses, orchids, violets, amaryllis, daffodils, and daisies, among many, many others. The angiosperms are also different from the gymnosperms in how they store and distribute their seeds. 
where the gymnosperms produced seeds that were exposed to the elements and dispersed randomly along the ground or stuck in the fur of some passing animal, the angiosperms wrapped their seeds in fruit. The fruit structure is a tasty and nutritious envelope for the seeds that provides a number of advantages. First and foremost, animals will eat the fruit because it's tasty and nutritious, and the seeds will pass through the animal's digestive tract. As the animal will move or fly around after eating, it will inevitably poop out the seeds at some distance away from the parent plant. This animal-assisted transportation helps the plant species spread and radiate across geographic space. Now, if the fruit falls off of the plant without being eaten by an animal, then the seeds have a chance to germinate in the soil. And as the fruit decays, its rotting body leaks nutrients into the soil, and this gives a boost to the young seeds. It kind of enriches the immediate area that they're going to be germinating in, and so it makes sure that at least for the early seedling part of their life, they have a little bit of food to keep them going. While these fruit structures are certainly very useful, they're also very easy for parasites and other moochers to exploit. The sugary fruit can be infected with mold, or it can be used by various arthropod species to their exclusive advantage. For example, when a fruit is hollowed out and used by an insect as a site to store its eggs, or when the insect just straight up eats the fruit, the fruit is getting consumed, but the seeds aren't going anywhere. The plant isn't getting a benefit, while the insect is parasitically exploiting its tissue for the free resources. Alright, so now that I've briefly covered the history of plant evolution, I want to look at a few of the themes that defined and shaped this plant evolution. The growth and evolution of all organisms is dependent on their limiting factors, the things that they need to grow and survive that happen to come in a limited supply. The most important resources for land plants are light, carbon dioxide, and nitrogen, all of which can be difficult to access in certain circumstances. Carbon dioxide, for example, cycles with the seasons. The available carbon dioxide in the atmosphere increases during the winter when plants are dying and decaying, and the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere decreases during the summer when plants are extracting that CO2 to fuel photosynthesis, to produce the sugars that they need to grow and reproduce. Nitrogen is another one of these limiting resources, because nitrogen is integral to the stem, the leaf, the flowering tissues, and a lot of the biochemicals of all of the plants. Even though nitrogen is in the atmosphere in huge amounts, nitrogen doesn't cycle in quite the same way as CO2, because the molecular nitrogen isn't immediately bioavailable. This is because most plants actually don't have the chemical resources necessary to break the triple bond in molecular nitrogen. But nitrogen-reducing fungi do. Because of this, plants have evolved symbiotic relationships with these fungi, who give them bioaccessible nitrogen in return for sugars. There's also bacteria that can fix nitrogen, and plants have been known to incorporate these bacterial colonies into their roots to form these strange little symbiotic node structures, and these bacteria will fix the nitrogen and feed it to the plant, in return for the sugars that the plant derives from photosynthesis. Lastly, the light from the sun is perhaps the most important resource for land plants, and yet, light can be challenging to acquire. In places that have very dense vegetation, like a rainforest, the tree canopy can be so thick that little to no light reaches the forest floor below, even at noon on a sunny summer day. The taller plants can enjoy uninterrupted light from the sun, so they have to prioritize ways of protecting themselves from sunburn and excessive water loss from evaporation. This pressure encourages the evolution of a larger number of smaller leaves. Now, shorter plants have the opposite pressure. They have a general lack of regular or reliable light, and this evolutionary pressure has encouraged them to evolve fewer leaves. But each leaf is relatively large and dark green with high concentrations of photosynthetic pigments. This high concentration of the pigments enables these shorter plants to grab and process as much light as they possibly can, which is really important when you live on the heavily shaded forest floor. 
Okay, so do you remember the alternation of generations that I mentioned a few minutes ago? This is a method of reproducing that involves shifting back and forth between two different reproductive states, or two different body forms. It exists in many protista species, and I explored this phenomenon in episode 32 on the protists, and it also exists in all land plants. Before I get started on describing how plants reproduce, I want to start with two evolutionary adaptations that greatly helped the land plants colonize and thrive on dry land. The first adaptation is the development of a structure called a gametangia. This gametangia structure physically holds and protects the gametes, much like the ovaries and the testes in animals. In plants, however, the male gametangium is called an antheridium while the female gametangium is called an archegonium. All land plants have these basic structures, except for the angiosperms, which instead have specialized structures inside the flower that serve the same purpose. Where protista and water-dwelling plants just spill their gametes out into the surrounding environment, into the, into the surrounding water, the land plants store their gametes in the gametangia, protecting them from the harsher, drier, terrestrial environment. This takes me to the second major adaptation, which involves the archegonium, the, the female gamete storage structure. The archegonium holds the eggs instead of just spilling them out into the environment, and by holding the eggs and by keeping them retained, the plant can nourish and protect the young zygote. When most algaes and protista have their eggs fertilized to form a zygote, the zygote detaches from the parent's body, or the gametes have already been released and they meet somewhere else, and the zygote forms completely separate from the parent's bodies. In the land plants, the fertilized egg is retained on the mother's body, on the, on the mother plant's body. It's not let go, and this allows the plant to continue feeding the zygote for some time. A zygote that has ensured nutrition like this is that much healthier, and it's that much more likely to survive and reproduce on its own. Alright, now with that clarified, let's move on to the alternation of generations in land plants. This is a life cycle, or a reproductive cycle, that involves both a haploid stage and a diploid stage that alternate between each other. Or, in other words, stages where the organism has in their cells one or two copies of their genome, respectively. In the haploid stage, where the organism cells have just one copy of the genome, the plant uses spores to create a gametophyte, or an individual in the cycle that will then go on to produce gametes. This diploid stage, where the organism cells have two copies of the genome, uses the gametes to create a sporophyte or an individual in the cycle that produces spores. So you have gametes that create a sporophyte, and the sporophyte creates spores through meiosis. These spores will then go out and replicate asexually through mitosis to create a male or female gametophyte, which produces gametes that fertilize each other to produce a diploid zygote. The diploid zygote then grows into another diploid sporophyte, and the cycle starts all over again. Land plant replication is a perpetual back and forth between the sporophyte and gametophyte stages, between haploid and diploid. What differentiates plants is how long they spend in each stage. Some plant species are sporophyte dominant, meaning they spend the majority of their reproductive cycle in the sporophyte stage, while other land plants are the opposite, they're gametophyte dominant, and they spend most of their time in the gametophyte stage. All right, so let me give you some examples. Most mosses tend to be gametophyte dominant. They spend the vast majority of their time in the gametophyte stage. When their gametes fertilize and form a diploid zygote, the diploid zygote will stay retained on the female gametophyte and grow off of it. This emerging sporophyte structure is completely dependent on the female gametophyte for nutrition, and it lasts only long enough to produce spores. So in this case, the gametophyte's offspring is the sporophyte, but the sporophyte is little more than a weird growth that comes off of the gametophyte to produce spores, and these spores will produce more gametophytes, and so the gametophyte is the dominant stage in this moss reproductive cycle. Now, in contrast to your typical moss, 
The typical fern is sporophyte dominant. The large fern plant with its big frilly leaves that you would see on your typical nature hike is in the sporophyte stage. They release spores, which form really tiny gametophytes. These fern gametophytes are almost like a checkpoint, existing very briefly and only to ensure that the gametes fertilize into a zygote, which then immediately begins growing into another macroscopic fern, or a sporophyte. Now most of the later plants, or the higher plants if you will, like the gymnosperms and the angiosperms, are also sporophyte dominant which suggests that there was a major evolutionary shift in the Ferida plantea clade to favor the sporophyte stage over the gametophyte stage. The sporophytes can be heterosporous or homosporous, which is a label explaining how their spores form the gametophytes. In homosporous plants, they produce a single kind of spore, which develops into a hermaphroditic gametophyte. This hermaphrodite gametophyte produces both male and female gametes, and while it can sexually reproduce with other gametophytes, it's also capable of self-fertilization. On the other hand, the heterosporous plants produce two distinct types of spores. They'll produce microspores, which become the males, and they produce megaspores, which will become the females. The microspores, in particular, underwent a very unique evolutionary change. In the water, the plant sperm cells would swim from individual to individual. But on dry land, this watery travel corridor doesn't necessarily exist in every habitat. There isn't enough water to deliver swimming sperm from one plant to another. So on dry land, the plants have adapted to use the wind instead of the ocean currents to spread their seeds. The sperm cells evolved into pollen, which are lighter and able to withstand drier conditions. The pollen can float on the wind, or it can be carried in the feathers of a bird or in the fur of an animal, which helps propel the heterosporous land plants into drier habitats, away from the humid, water-saturated habitats of their ancestors. The seeds were another major evolutionary adaptation that I already touched on. The seed has a fertilized embryo that's surrounded by a packet of nutritious tissue. When the seed germinates, the young plant consumes this nutritious tissue for energy, for an early energy boost, kind of like the amniotic sac in a pregnant amniote animal. In the case of seeds, the sporophyte plant produces haploid microsporangia, which fertilize the haploid megasporangia, and this creates a diploid seed embryo. This diploid seed will grow into a sporophyte, like a mature hardwood tree, which will then start the cycle all over again by producing gametes. Do you also remember how I said that flowers use similar but different structures? Instead of an antheridium and an archegonium, flowers use a structure called stamen and carpels, which produce the sperm and eggs, respectively. Now, I won't go into too much detail in this particular episode, because the process is complicated and not very well understood, and I'll talk about this more in my episode on plant reproduction, but flowers undergo a type of double fertilization, where the first fertilization creates the actual zygote, and the second fertilization creates a triploid tissue called the endosperm. The endosperm is the nutritious tissue within the seed that will get consumed by the young germinating plant. The flowers of these angiosperms are like really ornate decorations that evolved in a symbiotic relationship with particular pollinators. A given species of pollinator, like a bee, is attracted to certain colors and scents and shapes, and the various species of flowering plants that bees pollinate have evolved flowers that try to maximize their appeal for the bee. The flowers are like advertisements, or lures, trying to bring a pollinator in close to help the plant reproduce. The pollinators will come and land on the flower, being attracted by the color and the scent, and they'll begin to collect sugar water called nectar. As the pollinator lands on the flower and digs around in the depths of the flower for nectar, it begins to get coated in pollen. And as this pollinating animal flies to other plants, to other flowers, some of this pollen will get shaken off and fertilize the megasporangia. This symbiotic relationship is extremely important for most ecosystems with flowering plants, as they've been shaped by evolution over millions of years 
to near perfection. The bee pollinating the flowering plant is a famous textbook example of the ecological role of plants, although it should be understood that plants do far more than just attract bees with pretty flowers. All of these land plants are extremely important for a healthy ecology, simply because they do so much for everything else. Not only do plants perform multiple critical functions for habitat stability, their physical bodies also become part of the ecology for everything else. Most importantly, plants produce molecular oxygen through photosynthesis. Recall when I discussed the cyanobacteria and their capacity for photosynthesis. This chemical reaction involves electrons taken from water reducing CO2, which produces sugars and molecular oxygen. This molecular oxygen goes back into the atmosphere, and it provides the oxygen that we breathe, that all animals breathe. Well, all of the green plants are photosynthetic too, and they all pump oxygen into the atmosphere, as their cells use light to power their photosynthesis. Places that have really dense vegetation, like the Amazon rainforest, have been colloquially referred to as the lungs of our planet, due to the sheer quantity of biomass that's breathing in carbon dioxide and breathing out oxygen through this process. Despite the size of the Amazon and the size of the other important rainforests like the Congo in Africa, the Valdivian in South America, and the Dane tree in Australia, despite all of the plants there, the blue-green algae called the cyanobacteria that live in the oceans and the soils produce way more oxygen than them all. Keep in mind that plants generally don't produce as much oxygen during the winter, because they don't cover the entirety of the dry land, and all the dry land only covers around a quarter of the earth. Meanwhile, the cyanobacteria live in the oceans, which cover three quarters of the planet, and the only thing that prevents the cyanobacteria from getting sunlight is the clouds in the sky and the depth of the water in which they swim. All things considered, the plants are kind of at a disadvantage when it comes to competing with cyanobacteria for oxygen production. Oxygen production isn't the only chemical trick that plants have. They also support ecosystem stability by holding in water. Water has a very high heat capacity, which means that water can absorb and hold a lot of heat. In humid areas, where the air is thick with water vapor, the heat accumulated throughout the day can be retained through the night because of this water vapor, and this makes tropical nights very comfortable and warm. In dry regions, it can get very hot during the day, but because there's no water to hold onto this heat, the heat can dissipate very quickly as the sun sets, and so it gets very cold at night. The land plants are able to retain water in the ecosystem in a number of ways. First, their leaves can intercept raindrops, which softens the landing of the raindrop. This might seem unimportant, but it's actually really critical for the stability of the soil. When you have heavy rains that are beating down on weak soil, it can easily break it all up and wash it downhill or downstream, but the leaves can soften the impact and thus protect the landscape. They can protect against washout, which means that the plants help to retain nutrients and the stability of the topsoil. And this is also a benefit for any burrowing animals, who would be harmed if their underground burrows were to be flooded or washed away or otherwise destroyed by a landscape that isn't stable. The physical body of the plant, like its stem and its leaves and branches and any flowers, will also interrupt the wind, and this serves the same purpose. In areas with very little vegetation, the wind can sweep across a landscape, and there's nothing to stop it or slow it down, and you can have very heavy erosion from dust particles that just sweep across the landscape and never get caught or stopped by anything. But in areas with very dense vegetation, the wind gets deadened by the cumulative resistance of a forest full of leaves and branches and trunks, and so this is why deep in a forest, there's often no wind at all. The air is quite still. This can be helpful for any flying insects, whose travel paths might be made more inefficient or more difficult if they were exposed to heavy winds. 
Now you also have the roots, and the roots, I think, are a really underappreciated part of the plant, because the roots are also very critical for soil stability. This physical network of roots that branches wildly and permeates underground and grows to a massive size, spreading across the topsoil and penetrating deep into the ground. These meshes of roots, these networks of roots, have a physical structure that helps to retain water and hold the soil together. This inherent stability makes it possible for all manner of organisms, like insects, rodents, birds, and lizards, to make their habitats in the soil, in burrows or nests or what have you. And this allows for much more diversity in the habitat, for more complexity in the local ecology. And it's all because the plant's roots are helping to hold the soil together. Besides retaining water and softening the wind and stabilizing the soil, the plants are also a fundamental part of the food chain. Because they absorb light energy directly from the sun and turn it into chemical energy in the form of sugars through photosynthesis, the plants are called primary producers. They basically transform the light energy into bioaccessible chemical energy, into, a, uh, into physical molecules, in the form of sugars, and the stuff that composes their bodies. When herbivores come and eat the plant tissue, they incorporate some of that chemical energy into their own bodies. When carnivores eat the herbivores, they take some of that chemical energy for themselves, and so on and so forth. The plants make all of this possible by taking energy and nutrients directly from the natural environment and converting them into raw biomass that sustains every other species of heterotroph from insects to tree frogs to rhinoceros. The emergence of green algae and land plants onto the dry crust of the world created an environment that's hospitable for the animal life that would follow. Like a complex symphony with instruments and melodies clashing and interacting with one another, the animals used the plants as food, as a habitat or shelter, or for any other purpose. And over evolutionary lengths of time, the plants and animals formed symbiotic relationships, where the life cycle or the behavior of one species became dependent on the body, behavior, or life cycle of another species. The history of the evolution of green plants is a story of aquatic life adapting to the rugged, dry conditions of life on land. This story is told through the evolutionary changes apparent in more than 400 million years of evolution. I wish I could have gone into more detail on a, on a lot of this stuff, like the alternation of generations, the symbiotic relationships that plants create with animals and fungi and other plants, and the high degree of ecological utility that plants provide. But I had to parse everything down to fit it into a practical timescale. In future episodes, I'll be exploring the lives of plants in much greater detail. If you enjoyed this episode, give it a like make a comment, or send it to a friend or a classmate to enjoy. And as always, thanks for listening.